My name is Deb Van Dynan. I'm an Associate Professor of English Education at Hope College, and I have the honor of being the NEA Big Read and Little Read Lakeshore Director. The NEA Big Read Lakeshore and Little Read Lakeshore programs are month-long community-wide reading programs focused on the reading of a common book. This year, because of COVID, we've switched to a mostly virtual program. We're excited for the possibilities that this presents us as we can expand our audience's scope and reach, as well as our ability to connect with speakers and experts that are beyond our geographical reach. Thank you for joining us this year as we explore Nathaniel Philbrick's In the Heart of the Sea and Marcia Diane Arnold's Galapagos Girl Gallup Thing. We hope you enjoy these events and learn lots about the book's topics and themes, as well as issues and important questions in our world today. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Danny Kosiba, and I'm here today to talk to you about whales. You were just lucky enough to read about them in In the Heart of the Sea and the story of how a whaling ship called the Essex was stranded by an attack by a sperm whale. I'm going to talk to you today about a little bit of their lives, how humans interact with them, whether it was 1800s whaling or just the stuff we've learned about them today. So for starters, I want to be able to give you a brief summary of what a whale is. Whales are a group that we call the cetaceans. That includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Despite what they might look like under the water, they are not a fish. These are mammals, just like you and I. And we know that because they're warm-blooded and they regulate their body temperature, just like you and I do. They also give birth to live young, and they nurse those young with milk that they produce they also breathe air, so unlike a fish, they're not filtering their air out of the water with their gills, but they're coming up to the surface and having to breathe air with lungs just like you and I. And they also have hair. It's not super evident, but it is visible when they're young and some of it goes away. Another key distinction to know about whales before we go any farther is that there's two main groups of whales. Ones that are called the toothed whales, ones that are baleen. Most of them fall into the tooth whales. There's about 80 or so different species. These are things like dolphins, porpoises, killer whales, sperm whales, like in the book. And baleen whales are what we would call the great whales, which are these massive ones like the blue whale or the fin whale. So obviously, tooth whales have teeth. They use these in a bunch of a variety of forms and functions, and it varies species to species. Baleen whales have these giant plates that we see right here that are called baleen. These things are actually made out of keratin, which are what our fingernails are made out of. And these massive plates are essentially a giant filter. So what this animal is doing here is it's taking a huge gulp of seawater, and what it's doing is using its tongue to push all the water out through these plates while keeping the food on the inside. So essentially, they function as a very large filter. Another key difference is that toothed whales have that single blowhole, as you see in this common dolphin over here. And over here, you see that baleen whales have two. Personally, I think it kind of looks like an upside down nose. It's kind of wonky, but that's a key difference as well. Another difference is that the toothed whales are usually found in groups. So when you think of groups of dolphins, groups of orcas, sperm whales, they're often found in groups based off of their family relations and other social uh, relationships like that. Whereas things like the baleen whales, like a humpback, like a blue whale, they spend most of their lives alone, and they are mostly solitary. And another key distinction is their types of diets. While they are all carnivores and they eat different varieties of fish, obviously when you use teeth, you have a little bit more variety. Uh, tooth whales can eat anything from sharks and seals, to sea stars, to squid, and other types of fish, whereas baleen whales are eating much smaller things that they can actually filter out, and they have a lot smaller throats, so they're eating things like krill and other very small species of fish. And then one last difference is that these animals are actually what we call sexually dimorphic, which means that there is a difference between the two sexes, male and female. In toothed whales, that means that they have significantly larger males than the females. So a male sperm whale often gonna be a lot larger than a female. 
but it's the opposite in baleen whales, where the females are going to be a lot larger than the males. Now that we kind of have a rough idea of what a whale is and what some of those groups are, I want to be able to explain to you what it might have been like to get into that tiny, tiny wooden boat like they did in the Essex and get up close to an animal like a sperm whale. And how that's kind of similar to a lot of stuff we do in whale research. So when you're looking for a whale, what exactly are you looking for? They're talking about these shoals of whales in the book, which is essentially what we would call a pod. A pod of whales is a group in sperm whales, probably about 10 animals. Sometimes those groups get together with other groups, so you can see 50 at a time. And it would look kind of similar to a shoal of other fish. And that's what those whalers are looking for. When they're looking for these animals, they're looking for that huge spout. When they're sitting up there on the mast, or when you're a scientist and you're in a boat, you're looking for that giant plume of breath that comes up. These take a bunch of different forms and shapes depending on the species and the size of the animal. This graph is a good description of kind of what those different clouds look like, uh, which are essentially giant clouds of snot. And as the book mentioned, they do kind of smell fishy, so they are kind of gross if you get them on you, they do smell gross. Um, this is an example of a blue whale, as you can see here. It's this giant plume that's probably 20 or so feet up in the air. Um, it's long and narrow. This example of a humpback whale here, they're a little shorter. Um, as you can see, environmental conditions have a lot of bearing on what it looks like. These are not the easiest thing to see from a far away away. And this next one is actually another blue whale. Sometimes it looks like a rainbow, so you get a super cool effect. And this one is from a sperm whale, which is what they were looking for most of the time. And as you can see, it kind of juts off at a weird angle. And that's because the sperm whale has a blowhole on the side of its head and at an angle. And that's why you get this weird kind of side-shaped blow. So they're looking for a lot of other things. Blows aren't the easiest thing to see. So if you're a whaler, you're also looking for what we call flukes. A fluke is each side of the tail. So one tail is two flukes. This is a humpback whale. Super obvious, very colorful. You can tell a different whale from another whale by the coloration. And actually on this whale, you can see here, these markings are from where it was attacked by an orca. So those tails tell a lot of different things. This is an example from a sperm whale. So this is one that they're looking at the most. And this graphic here just kind of shows us a bunch of different examples of a bunch of different species. They have a bunch of different forms. They could be a bunch of different colors. And they tell you a little bit different things about the whales. Another thing you're looking for is when these curious animals might pop their head up out of the water. And that's what we call in science a spy hop. It's a little more obvious than a tail or a big breath of snot. And then another more obvious one is a lunge, which is similar to a spy hop, but they're just going to shoot their head out of the water and go back down. And that's also a little more obvious. Another one, which is one of the two more obvious behaviors, are a tail slap or a tail hop. So what you see there is this animal lifted its whole back end out of the water and kind of threw it. We call that a tail hop. It's lobbing its back half out of the water. And what you're going to see again is you see it throws that huge back half of its body up and out of the water. And now you're going to see here what we call a tail slap. Where it's repeatedly bringing its tail up and down and slapping the water. That is super noisy. These animals are around 40 tons with this humpback whale. And it's a lot more obvious than just looking for some breath. And obviously, there are other things you can look for, and the most obvious being when the entire whale comes out of the water. And in science, this is what we would have called a breach. And this is something that would have been common for them to see as well. That is a very loud sound when an animal that is 50 tons jumps out of the water, and it is a lot more obvious. <laughs> so now what we're going to look at here is what it would be like when you take your 25-foot boat and you try and approach an animal that they said could have been up to 80 feet long back in the day. Today, the average sperm whale male might be around 60 feet long. It can live around 60 years. Its blubber thickness is around four to 12 inches. That's what you're trying to stick that harpoon through. And this animal can dive around 7,000 feet deep. And it could be down there for an hour and a half. So when these whalers were thinking, which direction are the animal's gonna go? Uh, they used that old adage that they counted the number of breaths that they saw from the animal. And that was going to be how many minutes it was going to be down. That 
might not mean anything. Um, from experience, those animals are going to do whatever they want to. You can't really predict what they're going to do. Uh, as the whalers so often learn, as they would take their tiny boats close to them and often get flipped upside down, or the animal would bite the boat, or things like that. Uh, it's hard to predict what those animals are going to do. The sperm whale has the largest brain of any animal that's ever existed, and you can see why they might get irritated if you get close to them. Sometimes it could be an accident. But I highly recommend maybe not taking your very small boat very close to an animal that is four times longer than your boat and weighs like 50 tons. Uh, this is similar to a lot of research work. Um, what we do in a technique called tagging, you would take a boat probably smaller than this, and we're going to stick a little piece of technology near the dorsal fin on an animal like this. And you're going to put this piece there, and it will record things like depth. Uh, how long it's diving, the temperature, any sounds that it's making. And you do this by sticking it to the whale with suction cups. We have to have a really long pole, you have to be very close, and you're probably in a boat that's half the size of this. So that requires a lot of practice, a lot of research permits. Uh, I urge you to never try and take your kayak or other small boat really close to a whale. It does end up poorly for a lot of people. The whales don't like it that much. And this is what happens if you mess with whales. Uh, you saw at the end of the book, they started to talk about in the 1860s, these sperm whales were getting more aggressive. Uh, and they were confused. Why are these whales attacking our boats? Well, if you're throwing spears at whales for a couple hundred years, they might pick up on it. Like I said, sperm whales have the largest brain in the animal kingdom. It's very possible they could recognize those boats and understand, hey, these are the boats that like to throw sharp stuff at us. That is very possible. Another thing I want to do is now that we have a rough idea of what it would have been like to be a whaler in these tiny boats, is to look at some other species that we could have encountered around the globe um, and some other stuff that the crew of the Essex would have seen. So the humpback whale is probably one of the most famous animals. They are very charismatic. This is what whale watching boats are going to see. These animals are the ones that migrate pole to pole across the earth. Some of them swim more than 16,000 miles every single year, which is three-fifths of the Earth's circumference. An animal like this would be around 40-ish feet long, around 40 tons. They could live 80 to 90 years. These animals are known for their acrobatics. Their Latin name is long-winged New Englander. As you can see from these pictures here, these pectoral fins, these long white fins on their sides, are about a third of their body length, or three times my height, which is six foot six. That's very long. They're also very well known for singing. If you've ever heard whale song, which I'm gonna play a short clip here. This is the humpback whale. This is the animal that they're singing all the time in their mating season, but we have no idea what it's for. These sounds, they come in phrases and themes, and we have zero idea why these animals are doing this, but it is one of the most shocking noises in the animal kingdom. It's super mysterious. We would really like to know what it means, but we really have no idea. Um, but it is very enjoyable, expressly, and they have this huge range of sound. So that's another animal they might have seen. Another one that they definitely encountered that they talk about in the book is an orca. If you remember when they were in the whale boats after they were stranded, they were actually harassed a little bit by an orca. There are a lot of studies about orcas that consider them one of the smartest animals in the world. The orca is actually the largest dolphin species. It's kind of like squares and rectangles. All dolphins are whales, but not all whales are dolphins. And the orca whale is actually a dolphin, the largest dolphin species. These are known for sea worlds, uh, movies like Free Willy. They might be close to 30-ish feet, they could live anywhere from 30 to 90 years, uh, around like 11 tons, and there are a ton of different ecotypes of orca, which is kind of like a subspecies, or just a different type of this same animal. These different types of animals are the apex predator of the ocean and probably the world. They are super effective, they do anything from using waves that they create to knock seals off of ice to catch them, they use their tails to stun sharks and flip them upside down and just eat a great white shark. They eat fish, they eat salmon. There's a variety of different ones and they all do a bunch of different, very, very cool techniques. 
Another species that you might see is the gray whale. These are these well-known animals from the west coast of the United States. They're known for their yearly 10,000 mile migration up and down from like Baja, California to around Alaska. These animals are known as bottom feeders. They have these baleen as well, but what they're doing is they're rolling around in the mud on the bottom of the ocean and getting invertebrate food there. They're also very well known for their curiosity around boats. They're often seen in videos coming up to whale watching boats and seeking out attention from whatever's going on there. And another very cool thing they do is they're known to surf. So these animals, when they're near a coast, they'll come out to a surf break, they'll sit and wait for a wave, they'll ride it in, and they'll come back and do it again. So gray whales like to have a good time, apparently. Uh, it's a very good time. Recommend seeing that video. Another animal that they did encounter for sure is they talked about the porpoise. The porpoise is a family of whales that are not dolphins. They're these tiny, social, near coast animals that could be around five feet. They're only a couple hundred pounds. They're a lot harder to see. Um, they're social with each other and they're usually very curious around boats. And if you remember from the story, uh, the whalers were kind of irritated with them because they couldn't catch them. Another species that is common is the right whale. The right whale was fished to near extinction in the 1800s by whalers. It was called the right whale because it is the right whale to hunt because it is this huge, around 50 feet long and 70 ton animal. It's very slow and it was very easy for these old whaling boats to catch up with and hunt. Around the east coast of America today, the North Atlantic white whale only has around 400 animals left due to that type of whaling. So these animals are very big and you can see that they have all these calluses on their head and that's kind of how you tell one right whale from another. Something else they might encounter is arguably the most mysterious of any of the whales, a group called the beaked whales, animals that can dive down deeper than 10,000 feet into the ocean, greater than three miles, and they can stay down there for two hours. These, more than any other whale, rely vastly on sound more than light. There is no light 10,000 feet under the ocean surface, and they need to be able to use sound to not only communicate with each other, but they use it to see their environments, to see their prey, and it's absolutely vital to everything that they're doing. These are animals that there's about 20 or so species. Some of them we've only found out that they exist because they've washed up on shore, and we only really know a little bit about maybe three or four of these species. They're super hard to follow, they spend so much time so deep in the ocean, and they're super mysterious, but we do know that they're eating things like fish and squid, sea stars and sea cucumbers while they're down there, but they are very hard to follow an animal that is so, so far deep beneath the ocean. The fin whale is another animal they probably would have come across. It wasn't able to be whaled until around the 1900s when things became more industrial. These animals are the fastest of the great whales, these very, very large ones. They can go up to 25 miles per hour, so a wooden whale boat probably couldn't keep up. It's the second largest animal to ever live, it could be around 80 feet long, maybe around 80 tons, and they could live for around 100 years. This is another massive animal they might have encountered out in the open ocean. Another animal, obviously, is a dolphin. Most people know what these are. This group of animals is these vast groups of very social animals that can live all across the globe, from shallow coastal waters to deeper oceanic ones. Sometimes in groups that live in the same place all the time, some that migrate all across the globe. Sometimes they end up in groups of thousands of them, and they're very well studied for their intelligence, like the bottlenose dolphin. Animals that we've known to be able to use tools, um, they've detected that in their own communication with each other, they might have sounds that are for their own names, and they're very well studied. And now we get to the largest animal that has ever existed on Earth, which is the blue whale. Invariably, these were not able to be whaled in the 1800s, but they were later on. These animals travel the entirety of the globe, and they are nearly 100 feet long. They can be up to 200 tons and live for 80 or 90 years. They're bigger than any dinosaur that ever existed. They're nearly 20 times heavier than a Tyrannosaurus rex. They're the same length as a Boeing 737 airplane, 
but four times heavier than that. Its tongue alone probably weighs close to that of a full-grown elephant. Its heart is as big and as heavy as a small car. As you can see from this nice graphic here, even an animal like the humpback whale, which is very immense at 40 tons and around 40 feet, is dwarfed by the largest animal that ever existed. And I think that this comparison means a lot, is that it takes nearly 3,000 people that weigh around 150 pounds to equal one full-grown blue whale. It is the largest animal there ever was and ever will be. So now I want to talk a little bit about how whales have interacted with the world throughout their existence and how they've led a complicated interaction with humans throughout their time as things like whaling progressed to where we are now. So obviously with whaling, it's something that has existed for around 8,000 years. There's evidence dating back to uh, Neolithic South Korea. A lot of indigenous cultures have interacted with whales and used whaling for a very long time. And they've done so in sustainable ways but in other cultures where it's become more industrialized, it has not been as sustainable. Around the 19th century, about 230,000 sperm whales were killed. That's just sperm whales. In the 20th century, that number was over 700,000. Now that whaling was more, there is a moratorium placed in 1986 by the International Whaling Commission. This group, halted whaling on all sorts of different species, even though countries like Iceland and Japan and Norway and the Faroe Islands still participate, numbers have been able to recover in things like the blue whale and things like the humpback whale and sperm whales, but there's still so much damage that has been done and they are still being participated in. Another thing I want to think about is how shipping impacts whales. Shipping as the world has become industrialized in a global society, Ships crisscross the entirety of the earth everywhere that you would find whales migrating back and forth or just living as residents. There are these massive ships coming through. That's not only a big difference in terms of the noise that they're making from the silent oceans of before, but also the danger it is for animals coming through there. Things like the right whale that I showed you, many of them die when they're hit by ships, and that is very, very dangerous for a population of animals that's near extinction. Another thing, that's become new as the world has progressed is captivity. I'm sure all of you are familiar with aquariums, things like sea worlds. Um, needless to say, animals that travel thousands of miles throughout their life should not be spending 40 to 50 years of their lives in a very small tank. Now, many countries have started to move away from this. Very recently, a country like Canada has outlawed captivity of things like whales and dolphins, but it still exists in a lot of countries and it is not great for those animals. Another thing that's very popular today is ecotourism. So we think about things like whale watching. This is an industry that now is around $2 billion worth across the globe, and around 13 million people participate in it every single year. That's a lot of people traveling all the way across the globe, all over the place, California, Iceland, Norway, all these places popular for whale watching. And it needs to be done in a way that's respectful to the animals. I've personally taken part in studies that look at how stressed out an animal can go if whale watching boats don't give them the space, the respect, and the, the time that they need to actually live their lives. So ecotourism, while I'm a huge proponent of how it can teach us to interact with wildlife, show us these monumental animals that we never get to interact with in our lives. It needs to be done correctly, it needs to be done safely, not only for the whales, but also for people. Another big thing, is pollution. We think about oil spills, we think about garbage, and it is bigger than those two things. Plastics obviously are a huge issue these days. We think about, we hear all about microplastics, how it's part of the water, it's invariably part of the ocean and seawater now. But what's really big for whales is that this garbage that we see in the ocean, our water bottles, now our disposable masks, these gloves, this is stuff that whales eat. Other sea life as well, including birds and turtles. And oftentimes, in the last couple of years, when you see these whales wash up when they die, their insides are full of plastic. There was one sperm whale that died, they found up to 150 pounds of plastic waste inside of it. Another type of pollution that's not as commonly talked about is noise pollution. So like I said about shipping, as there's more boats in the ocean, you're getting more and more noise. 
And as these animals are so reliant on sound, things like the beaked whale that navigate miles, miles deep, if there is naval sonar, they've been known to actually die because of it. It ruptures their eardrums and they can't find food. These things are more than just that. It can be fatal. But every 10 years, the sound intensity of the ocean doubles. In the last 60 years alone, any noise that something like a humpback whale would make, if it's singing, it can only travel a tenth as long. Typically, the noises of a whale like that, they could travel almost a thousand miles or more to hear other animals. So it's really changing their worlds. And when sound is to a whale, like light is to us above water, because eyesight means a lot less to them down there, it's really hard when we're filling this and essentially blinding them with noise. Another thing to consider is the fishing industry. Fisheries are really important to tons of cultures around the globe, and whales are very important parts of that. They not only sustain fish stocks and control nutrient cycling, but they help the fishing industry be profitable. Almost two thirds of all fish populations around the globe are overfished or fished to capacity at this point in time. This is bad in terms of those fish themselves, but also that means that the whales are losing a lot of their prey and a lot of the food they need to survive. Another big part of the fishing industries is that the plastic that they use in terms of their gear, their nets, their lines, these traps, those things are discarded a lot of the time. Up to 700 tons, 700,000 tons is discarded into the ocean every single year of these broken nets and these broken lines. These things tangle up whales, they get caught in their mouths, on their tails, on their fins, they catch sharks, they catch turtles, and this kills millions of animals every single year, and it really needs to be monitored. Another thing that is very prevalent today, as we, we consider the frequency of storms, the amount of carbon emissions that we're having, the sea level rise, greenhouse gas emissions do have a big impact on the ocean. Uh, as greenhouse gases are released into the air, the ocean itself is a huge carbon sink. These gases we release are absorbed by the ocean, and in a change, it increases our temperature, which is a big thing when you think about how it deals with ice. Ice is a big habitat for ice-fixed algae, which feeds things like krill, and those krill feed whales. Krill populations have dropped by 70 to 80% as we've lost more ice. Another large issue related to this gas is how acidic the ocean becomes. As the ocean absorbs more carbon as it's regulating the temperature of the globe, things that make shells like coral or snails, things that need the particular nutrients in the water to make those shells, they can't do it if it's too acidic. And things like reefs can't survive and some of the prey that animals pay attention to. So greenhouse gases have a big effect on the oceans, and all these things together have a very large effect on the world that the uh, whales live in today. So now I just want to talk about how important these whales are to the world as a whole. We've learned a little bit about what some of them are, how their world has changed from whaling to our interactions with them, but they remain as important as ever regardless of how the world has changed. We'll start by talking about what phytoplankton are. Phytoplankton themselves, as you see in this graph, cover the entirety of the globe. They're a small microscopic algae that photosynthesizes just like a plant. And by doing so, they're taking in carbon dioxide that's released in the air in things like climate change or just general functioning of the world. And they're releasing oxygen and creating energy for the ocean. Phytoplankton are the base of the food web for much of the ocean, which feeds all the animals throughout. And they make as much as 50 to 80% of all oxygen on the globe. Phytoplankton, like this microscopic algae, are responsible for more than every other breath that we take as humans. That means every single year they're also capturing a lot of carbon. They capture 40% of a yearly CO2 that's released into the air, which is 37 billion tons. That is equal to 1.7 million trees, which could be four Amazon rainforests, or 70 times greater than the Redwoods National and State Parks in California. So phytoplankton are this essential part of the ocean. And whales are essential to phytoplankton. Whales, through their massive movements across the ocean, they're migrating thousands and thousands of miles, they're diving so deep, 
They are providing nutrients to areas of the ocean that wouldn't have it. When whales poop in something like a humpback whale, they make a lot, a lot of poop. <laughs> There's a lot of nutrients in that that helps phytoplankton grow, which helps phytoplankton create more oxygen, take in more carbon, and provide more nutrients to the entirety of the ocean. So whales are essential to this cycle of processing carbon that's released into the atmosphere. As they go up and down through the water column, they're cycling nutrients as well. The deeper ocean has a lot less nutrients. And as an animal that can be many, many tons, like a humpback being around 40, their personal body can hold up to 30 tons of carbon by itself throughout its entire life. And when it dies, that animal sinks to the bottom of the ocean. That there becomes food for other invertebrates in the deep sea. It also becomes incorporated into the sediments in the deep ocean. This nutrient cycle goes on across the globe, and it's absolutely essential to how the ocean functions, the oxygen that it's producing, the nutrients that it's producing, which are essential, not just to the ocean and the fish that live there that we are trying to be dependent on, but also the oxygen that we depend on as well. And whales with their movements, like you see here in a humpback whale as they move from breeding to feeding grounds, they cover the entirety of the globe. And this is just an example of one species in particular. So this study that I've been referencing in all these graphs is from the International Monetary Fund. And what they did is they tried to ascribe an economic value in this last year to what one great whale is worth. This is something like a humpback or a fin whale or a blue whale. So as I referenced before, they're essential to phytoplankton. This nutrient cycling of whales moving throughout the globe is essential to the amount of carbon that phytoplankton can capture and the amount of oxygen that they produce. That equals out to around 37 million tons of CO2 a year. They're also essential to things like the fishing industry, which is worth over $150 billion across the globe. This is something that every culture participates in. It's essential not only to indigenous beliefs in a lot of cultures, but it's also how so many people get their food, how they work, and how they interact with the environment. This industry is vital to the world, and whales contribute to that by providing nutrients and controlling a lot of these fish stocks. Whales help fish stocks be more healthy, which helps us as fishers. And we need to be able to acknowledge the value they provide to that and do it in such a way where we're not harming them with that industry as well. Another area they bring so much value is whale watching. As you can see, it covers about $2 billion globally. That industry is centered all on whales, things like the humpback that are super acrobatic, super charismatic. And without whales, there's obviously no whale watching industry. So we need to acknowledge the value there and also be able to do so in a way that's respectful to the animals while allowing us to interact with them in their environment and to be able to learn so much. And as I also referenced in a prior slide is that throughout the life of an animal that can weigh 40 or 50 tons, it's taking in a ton of carbon itself. Carbon sequestering, just like a rainforest does or a tree does, that carbon is taken out of the air and the environment and into them. And when they die, they take around 30 tons of that to the ocean floor to be used by other animals. So this study, they tried to give a value to one of those animals by itself. And at the low end of estimates, a single whale, like a humpback whale, is $2 million worth of value to the globe. We think about how there's only around 1.3 million of these great whales in the world today, after things like whaling, and pollution, and shipping, and noise. If we were back to pre-whaling and pre-human interactions with them, we would have around four to five million of these animals. These animals increase phytoplankton production by so much, which means more carbon capture, which means more oxygen and nutrients for the world. Just a single percent increase in phytoplankton production which could be helped by these animals, would be equal to more than 2 billion trees being planted. That is essential. If we put together all the animals that exist today as great whales, that 1.3 million, their value would be around $1 trillion to the globe. And this is a number that should be much, much higher due to all of our interactions. Four to five million before whaling. These animals provide an essential value to the globe. In all these different ways, their nutrient cycling, and all these different things that have been going on. They're vital to the air that we breathe as humans, that the rest of the organisms on Earth interact with. 
They're vital to the ecosystem of the ocean, where every other breath of air that we breathe as humans comes from. I want us today to just end thinking about how valuable these animals are. We've learned a lot from this book, and I hope from this presentation, about all these different wonderful animals, how we've interacted with them in a ton of different ways throughout our existence on this earth. How these animals that are literally larger than life, some of the largest animals that have ever existed, are essential to our existence as well. And in spite of all the detrimental things and the mistakes that we've made as humans in their world, in the ocean, that they still provide value like this to our world. We can still improve on the mistakes that we've made in all these different ways and make a better world for them so that we can allow animals like this that provide us so much value, that they're so engaging and mysterious and we just want to know more about them. We can help them to help us. So I just want to hope that everyone learned a lot about all these mysterious animals and really all the ways that we still have so much more to learn about them, but to acknowledge that they're essential to us, they're essential to the whole world, to all the other animals in the places that we love, and that they are very, very cool, and that they are just super important to this globe. So I want to end with obviously thanking a lot of people for being here. I'd like to thank Hope College for allowing me to be a part of the Big Read. I hope you all loved In the Heart of the Sea as much as I did. It is a crazy, crazy story about a whaling ship in the 1800s. Um, I hope it made you appreciate more of what happens when you might mess with an animal that's very, very large. But also it gave you an opportunity to learn more about them, about an industry that was very interesting in our past in this country and in many others. And I hope that you participate in the Big Read again because it is a great resource for some great, great books. I'd like to thank the doctors Wynette Murray and Mr. Murray because they made me the scientist that I am today, which is hopefully a not so bad one. And obviously for working today to be a part of this event. And I'd like to thank the University of Iceland and the group Whale Lives because I worked with them on a lot of these projects where you saw some of these pictures that I took today. So just thank you very much, and I hope you learned at least something about some of the largest and most interesting animals in the world. Wow, Danny, that was such a great presentation. I learned so much about so many things. I had no idea that an orca was a dolphin. So that is one of the highlights that I wrote down. <laughs> I also wanted to start off by saying hello to all of our viewers. Thank you for coming to Hidden Giants, The Mysterious Lives of Whales with Danny Kosiba. My name is Tabitha Burink. I am a member of the NEA Big Reed Lakeshore team. I wanted to start off by saying a huge thank you to two of Hope College's biology professors, Dr. Kathy Winnett-Murray and Dr. Greg Murray. We appreciate you so much for introducing us to Danny. Dr. Kathy Winnett-Murray began teaching biology, zoology, and ecology at Hope College in 1986. Dr. Winnett Murray has had a continuing role in introductory biology courses for for biology majors and non-majors. Her research focuses on responses, responses of animals, most often birds, to environmental changes brought about by human alteration, alteration of habitats. Uh, Dr. Greg Murray teaches courses ranging from introductory biology to upper level explorations of topics including population and community ecology, conservation biology, mathematical biology, and marine biology and biophysics. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Since you both had Danny in class, I will let you do the honor of introducing him before our Q&A discussion. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to connect with Danny again in this way because we haven't seen him in person for quite a while. And I welcome you all to this uh, big read event. One of the themes of uh, In the Heart of the Sea is about the relationship between the human community that was on Nantucket Island and their really, really serious dependence on a particular natural resource, which is whales. And, and so that really struck me as one of the most important themes of the book and, and one of the ways I see a big connection with what Danny is doing with his career and the thing that he aspires to do because He's done so many things since he graduated from Hope and all of them have been about promoting 
the relationship between human communities and the natural world in a way that people will see themselves as a part of nature rather than community activities being apart from nature. So that dependency has been really, really important. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Danny and, and some of the things that he's done. Um, he is a Michigan native. He grew up in Vicksburg, Michigan before he came to Hope College and then he was a biology major. Um, we had him in some classes, which was just a, a mutual learning experience for sure. But um, one of the ways that we got to know Danny the most um, in a field related experience was when a project got started because there was a wetland being constructed out of what used to be a cornfield right on the edge of Holland next to the West Michigan Regional Airport. And the reason that the Outdoor Discovery Center wanted to create that wetland was to improve wildlife habitat and bring a lot of critters back to the environment. Yet, because of the close proximity to the airport, there was a little bit of concern about, well, if we bring in a lot more wildlife, is that going to pre present an, an air traffic hazard? And so there were several students at HOPE. Um, working with Dr. Murray and I that went out at the crack, literally at the crack of dawn and right at sundown for days and days and days. All together, this, this group of students worked for that on three years. Danny was a huge part of the first year and they monitored the wildlife to um, document the return of animals and the biodiversity that was happening at the new site as, it, as the habitat became transformed. And to be able to work with people in the community about whether there was an increased risk or, or not. And so um, that was just kind of our first experience with Danny being really, really interested in um, how does this connect with what's happening in the community and how people are working together. Then he did a study abroad program um, in New Zealand at the University of Canterbury, which led to him getting a position as a research assistant with a whale research group that was headed by um, the world-renowned Nan Hauser. And that was a life-changing experience for Danny. We know that it was because of the way he talked about it when he came back to Hope. He was just so profoundly altered by that experience. By the next year, he was going in a completely different direction to work on whales in Iceland and in a really different context, but um, a major turning point for Danny as well. And then since then, he's been really focused on a lot of community projects. He has worked for the city of Oxnard in California. He has worked in Wyoming for Tumbleweed Farms. And he is currently a volunteer coordinator and urban planning assistant for Deer Flat National Wildlife Refuge in Idaho. And in all of these regards, he's doing what I mentioned at the outset. He's working with community programs to help people understand how being a part of nature rather than apart from it is really, really important for them to connect to each other and to connect with the resources in the natural world. And so I'm just, I'm just thrilled that he's working on what he's doing and he's thinking about going to graduate school sometime in, <laughs> sometime in the future as well, but he's gaining a wealth of experience in the interim. So um, thanks for being with us all the way from Idaho tonight, Danny. And um, we're going to invite people to ask you that some questions. That sounds great. Thank you for introducing me. I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of channel the questions uh, to Danny, but I, I want to say just one other thing about, uh, you know, sort of by way of introdu uh, introduction of him to everybody, because I know that there are a lot of current and, uh, you know, students of various ages that are watching this and, and um, having watched a lot of students over the years uh, go from being, you know, entering college students and, and then going on to careers of their own. Um, Danny really uh, sort of epitomizes the, the, the people who are really adventurous that, that, you know, are presented with an opportunity and they grab it and go and learn something new. And then they go and learn something else. Being adventurous like that is like, that's the way to become successful and to have a really interesting life. And so I think you can uh, sort of see in, in, in what Dr. Wynette Murray said about his breadth of experience. 
and he's uh, he's not that old a, a guy yet, but um, he's he's had a, an incredible breadth of experience, and I and I think that speaks toward his personality and his engagement with with the world, and it's a good example for other people. Um, as I look through the questions that people have asked, it, uh, they started coming in very shortly after he started to present, and they can you can still submit um, questions in the you know in the comment um, uh, line over on the right of your screen, and I encourage you to do that. But I um, there there are probably more here than we we may get to uh, through the the time that we have together, but. But I did want to uh, hit on a couple and just sort of channel those to uh, uh, to Danny. Um, first of all, the, uh, as I look through these, some of them uh, have some similarities between them. But but uh, one that I, I thought was intriguing in the context of the book is by Abigail Noner. And she asks, um, the Nantucketers used every part of the whale they caught. Whale oil was harvested from the blubber. Um, but what were the other parts of the whale used for? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, specifically for the Nantucketers, I mean, not just the, the blubber that they boiled down into oil. Um, that oil was used for things like lighting lamps uh, along their streets and in their homes. Um, the spermaceti, which is the waxy substance that comes from that massive head of a sperm whale, that was specifically used for things like uh, transmission lubrication. Um, people used ambergris from a sperm whale's intestines to make perfumes. Um, other substances were used to make candles. Um, I want to say up until the late 70s, um, General Motors used um, parts of whales to lube transmission fluid. Um, and it actually played a large part in the creation of military munitions for a while as well. Um, and countries like Russia, when they had less access to more cheap things as they came along, um, the, they found more and more uses for these historical uh, bits of whales that the Nantucketers really kind of streamlined. Um, and their baleen was used as well. That was used for things like hair combs. Uh, people created canes with it. They made corsets, they made frames for their glasses, uh, kind of anything and everything, you name it, people used it. Um, and this started as far back as indigenous populations, um, like in Alaska or the Arctic, who to this day still, still whale. Um, and they do it in a very sustainable ways and in ways where just like these Nantucketers used to, uh, they use every piece of the whale. Weren't um, weren't uh, the uh, the teeth of sperm whales in particular used for scrimshaw as as well to uh, like carving into them like ivory was, was right. were other whale uh, teeth used in that way too? Uh, not that I know of, just because not many whales have teeth that large in general, um, okay. and sperm whales have the most as far as large and actually having teeth compared to a baleen whale. Okay, thank you. Um, Kaylee McKee asks, if, if you got swallowed by a whale, could you survive? <laughs> Great question. Um, so if you were swallowed by a baleen whale, there is a chance you could survive because their throat is not large enough for you to actually make it into the rest of the whale. Um, that's why they're eating things like krill. Um, they're eating very small species of fish or um, the, the younger versions of fish, essentially, because their throat is very, very small. Um, and I, I can't think of a number off the top of my head, but uh, if something like a humpback whale were to accidentally swallow you, it wouldn't actually be able to swallow you. So you might just get spit back up. Um, and I encourage you to Google this. Uh, in the case of sea lions and seals, because occasionally in places like Monterey Bay in California, uh, a humpback whale will accidentally end up with a seal in its mouth, and the seal is normally okay because they have to spit it back out. Um, so maybe you could. But I guess it depends on how long you can hold your breath. <laughs> um Annalise uh, Sala, who's a, a former student uh, from Hope College. Hi, Annalise. Uh, she asks, uh, what restrictions or policies are currently in place to control 
whaling and how are they enforced? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. It's a great one, Annalise. Um, I believe I mentioned in passing just that in the 80s, this, this group called the International Whaling Convention or Commission is, they placed a moratorium on whaling. Uh, they're essentially a voluntary group that was started in, I want to say, the 40s. And it's a collection of countries that basically came to an agreement understanding that commercial whaling was, was having a very big negative impact on a lot of populations throughout the globe. And all of these countries came together voluntarily and they came up with restrictions. Uh, it started as quotas for the number of whales you could catch. And now these things have evolved to the point where a lot of countries are a part of this or they're also following these guidelines in conjunction with things like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and how they designate things as endangered species. And basically these, these rules boil down to the countries that are participating. Um, so if I could call... A recent reference with uh, the country of Iceland, they still perform fin whaling and minke whaling. There was an issue uh, right around the time I was there, around 2017, 2018, where they accidentally caught a blue whale, which is not generally allowed by most countries, uh, still a threatened species in a lot of places. And that might be something that is ruled as illegal or not allowed by the Whaling Commission but it is up to an individual country to follow through on those sorts of regulations and those policies. So it's super variable. Um, it's, it's tough to enforce. Uh, there are ways, there are loopholes that countries like Japan have extorted to get around these quotas or these moratoriums. Um, and it's really country to country, there's basically different rules. And luckily enough, not many countries rely on whaling for anything, if at all, anymore. Cool, thanks. Uh, Kirsten Galloway asks, what is your favorite whale encounter you've ever had? And I, I know they're, these are of different sorts because I've heard you speak of some of them, but. Yeah, there's, that is a, a wonderful question and a hard one. Um, I would say my favorite encounter still boils back to the first time that I was ever in the water while a humpback whale is singing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, humpback whales are the, the songbirds of the ocean, essentially. Um, if you've heard whale song before with all these large whoops and hollers and all these different kind of alien noises, it's most likely a humpback whale. Um, it's very, very loud. It's something they do during their breeding season uh, in, in the winter. Um, and when you're in the water or when you're near them in a boat, you can literally feel this sound. Um, so you can think about how kind of in the old days that they used to think there were sea monsters under them um, when they would hear this ethereal sound coming through them. Because if you're close enough in a boat, uh, it'll vibrate up through the bottom of your boat. So you can actually hear them above water as well. But me being in the water for the very first time with this, uh, it's kind of like uh, it's very alien. It's it's like a dinosaur in front of you, and it literally just vibrates your whole body. So rather than me just hearing the song of this large 40-ton animal in front of me, uh, it was more so a function of me feeling it as it rattled my entire body. Um, and that's that's definitely one of my favorite experiences to this day. Cool. Um Kim Armitage asks, um, hi, com uh, completely engrossing content, love the phytoplankton information. Her question is, has the, pl the plume, the water and mucus, ever been collected and used to diagnose disorders or diseases in individuals or even uh, in the, the whole shoal of whales? Oh, yeah. that is a great question. Um, thank you. Miss Arm for this uh, question. She is my high school biology teacher, so <laughs> she's keeping me on my toes uh, I forever and ever. Um, so as far as I know, I, I don't know of any specific studies for disorders. That's not something I have worked with directly, but they have been uh, a lot more uses of technology now that we understand that there are high enough concentrations of hormones um, and genetic data in this whale snot, um, essentially, a mixture of whale snot and water, um, that you can, you can tell a great deal about them. So 
in a specific study I was a part of, we were using this information to look at the stress hormones in whales. Uh, and that's measured through um, hormones like cortisol. Uh, so there are, there are a, a lot of different hormones that you can get from just a, a giant breath of whale snot. Um, but as, as far as I know, which is there's a million species of whales and many people doing research, uh, I'm not specifically familiar with any work related to disorders through snot. I would assume that's something that's still heavily reliant on taking biopsies of their blubber. Um, but again, I'm not really sure. I, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, uh, Danny, too, and, and connecting it to um, one of the things that we at Hope College and at a lot of other institutions are doing now at, at testing for uh, coronavirus through the wastewater, uh, you know, coming out of buildings. It seems like people could study the microbiomes associated with whale lungs uh, by by being able to collect and analyze that stuff too. It doesn't take that much stuff. I wonder whether anybody's doing that. So that's, that is a cool idea. Um, Susan Banton asks, uh, I am lucky enough to live in the San Juan Islands. We have three pods of killer whales that eat only that only eat salmon. How do these whales differentiate types of fish to catch? That is a great question. Um, so as far as populations of whales around the U.S., the, the San Juan Islands are very enigmatic. They are a very visible conservation story for us um, with the southern resident killer whales that are there, um, which are the orcas and the largest dolphin. Uh, and I, I guess the best way I've ever had this phrase to me is that because there are about 10 different types of ecotypes of orcas, um, which essentially means for different habitats or ecosystems, the orcas do different things. They feed on different stuff. Uh, they are very picky eaters. That is, that is the best way I've ever heard it explained to me. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that the San Juan animals, they focus heavily on salmon, um, which is part of the reason why that, that population of animals is suffering because of the declines in salmon. So they do know specifically the types of salmon that they're eating. Um, and as you move throughout the world, these different ecotypes have different prey that they focus on. Some uh, more ocean oceanic species will eat great white sharks. Um, and in that, they'll eat primarily just the livers out of these animals because it's higher in fats. Um, other species or ecotypes of orcas eat specifically marine mammals. Um, so some of them will hunt and try and get humpback whale calves or gray whale calves. Other ones will eat things like seals and sea lions only. Um, other ones like around Norway, those groups focus a lot on herring and different species of fish in and out of the fjords there. So orcas really are some of the most finicky eaters because they are so prevalent across so many different types of ecosystems across the globe within the ocean that they really have just adapted to anywhere and everywhere that they're at, they've adapted to the food source that is most specific to them. Cool. Um, I thought I would ask a question here that actually comes from Kathy, and and it was one that I, you know, we were we were talking about uh, uh, these things beforehand. She asks, you mentioned that we probably know the least about the biology of the beaked whales, but I know that you witnessed and recorded information following a mass stranding event that took place in Iceland a few years ago and that there was some correlative evidence suggesting a relationship with those with noise pollution caused by underwater military testing in the area. Um, are whales sensitive to noise pollution simply by virtue of being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or are some species of whales like beaked whales more vulnerable to, to noise uh, because of particular anatomical and or social communication differences? among, you know, that are unique to their species? Yeah, so that's that's a fantastic question. Um, and invariably, when you think of instances like the ones that I experienced related to a mass stranding, um, they are, they're related to toothed whales. Um, actually, this last week in Sri Lanka, there was another couple hundred pilot whales that washed up. Um, 
But in most of these instances, it's, it's related to the toothed whale group and most often the beaked whales. And this has to do most likely with how heavily that these animals, in particular, more so than any other whales, are heavily reliant on sound to navigate pretty much the entirety of their world. Uh, as these animals are navigating depths like miles and miles deep, uh, they can't, there's no light there, there's nothing they can see, so they rely on very, very highly developed sense of hearing. Um, their ears are very important in terms of studying what they can, uh, the potential side effects of something like a sonar. And, and that's how they find their food, it's how they communicate with each other, and it's how they understand the geography of things around them. In instances of naval sonar like that, uh, there have been multiple instances where it has been the direct cause of death for animals like this. And when it comes to naval sonar, the, we're, there are more and more studies where they're finding out the correlation to how close an animal can be for it to cause types of damage where it will permanently damage their eardrums or kind of put them in a state where they're too stressed, where they might surface too quickly um, and get something like decompression sickness like human divers get if they surface too quickly. So there have been a large number of studies over the last, I'd say, 20, 30 years that are studying um, instances where you have these mass strandings. And these are things where we're seeing physical evidence of damage to their ears directly. So they can't navigate. They can't catch their, their food. Um, essentially, they might starve. Uh, and oftentimes, it leads to them washing up on shore because of that inability to navigate without being able to use sound. So it is something that is heavily researched and beaked whales are kind of the, the poster children as a species and a group of species that they're most susceptible to damage from naval sonar. Yeah, thank you. I, I remember when you were writing um, every couple of days when this event happened and uh, basically you and a small team of volunteers were just left high and dry without any experts that really knew how to take the samples that needed to be taken. I remember you talking about kitchen knives and uh, I was just envisioning you trying to get pieces of those dead whales ears with kitchen knives and stuff. <laughs> it must have been a really, really profound experience. Yes, it's, it's definitely a very telling and, and visceral example of some of the newer technology and the impacts that it can have on animals that we don't really know a lot about because they spend their life miles below the surface. Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating too and, and for a variety of reasons, but one is that you know, we we live in a world where most of us think that that most things have been discovered already, and there there certainly couldn't be any animals in the world that we just don't know much at all about. But when you really start to learn about things, you find out that there's there's all kinds of really really basic information that you'd think would have been known for for hundreds of years that that we don't know about species that are um, that are even you know not even as obscure um, and and hidden as are a bunch of those whales um, so there's there's lots of work to do by adventurous people um, Elijah van Dynan asks uh, why do you think people have been fascinated by whales throughout history and I would add to that you know once people decided that it was you know that there was meat there and then there was oil there you could understand them being interested for that reason but why have people been so fascinated by whales just in general i mean i think there are a lot of different answers to that question, obviously but i think that a lot of it boils down to just how different they are from anything that we we are as humans uh, and anything that we get to interact with, uh, you know, growing up in Michigan, we're going to see things like house sparrows and some white tailed deer, but we're not going to ever really see firsthand or fathom an animal that's going to be a couple hundred times larger than us and be bigger than a lot of dinosaurs that could have existed. Um, and they just come in so many different forms and functions. And, and you can imagine being, in a wooden boat or some early sort of water vessel early in life and seeing an animal that is larger than the boat you're on launching itself out of the water. Um, and we've seen how that, that relationship has evolved through whaling and all this other stuff to how big whale watching is today because people really wanna, they wanna know more, they wanna see more and they're trying to connect with these things. And 
we think about the humpback whale as exemplary of this this you no know, this new huge burgeoning industry of whale watching where people are trying to connect with nature and see how it's a part of their lives near where they're vacationing or where they're at and a humpback whale is something that is you know it's launching its entire 50 ton body out of the water it's slapping it's singing it's doing all of these things that we aren't going to see we only see a very slim part of their lives they spend the rest of it under the ocean and they're just they're monumental in a lot of different ways and it's not just their size so i really think that there's just so many different things about them that kind of boil back to how mysterious they are and how different they are from us as creatures on the land is there's a lot to be uh curious about and they do spectacular things by any standards of wildlife watching so they really just really pique my curiosity but i can see how throughout history they've really spoken to people in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. yeah and for me at least the you know they're they're sort of foreign and familiar at, at the same time i mean they spend their entire lives in water and they're completely different uh, from us but they're mammals and and that's that you know it sort of adds to the fascination about them but um, following on the on what you said about ecotourism uh, and whale watching, Hannah Abel uh, or Abel um, asks which country or region has the most responsible or sustainable whale watching experience for tourists? Because I know that in some places, um, I, I would just add to that, I've heard in some places that there are criticisms of the industry, and some may be better you know, or more enlightened than others. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to the issue of um, just like anything, it's it's left up to individual countries. It's left up to d individual areas. Um, I know for a fact Hannah's been to Iceland, so she's seen that how whale watching has functioned in a country like that. And uh, for example, there, all of their guidelines are voluntary. Um, it's kind of a sign on if you want to for a nonprofit trying to spearhead these things. Uh, and we think about kind of examples of more sustainable and as we mo know more and more about the conservation issues, places like Canada and the Pacific Northwest are kind of the, the cream of the crop as it comes to really giving these animals the space and the respect they need in their ecosystems. Um, and a lot of this is sadly due just because of the populations at risk in their areas, which are the southern resident killer whales, which we, we referenced in an earlier question. Um, and here they, they don't let animals get within, I can't remember the specific numbers off the top of my head, but around San Juan and those areas, they don't allow boats to get within, I want to say 300 yards of orcas. Uh, and that's just, you know, an emphasis on these animals being a threatened population and really wanting to do as much as possible to have that balance of this really visceral environmental education experience where you're, you're getting to see this animal that's a little ethereal and different from anything you've ever seen and you want to connect with it, but also having to balance that with the health and the well-being of these animals and by extension, the ecosystems. So every country has, uh, it's, a, it's a melting pot of a bunch of different regulations and rules and how it's managed. Some places like Iceland are voluntary, other places it goes state to state like in the US. And there has been a lot more uptick in research to see just the, the impact that certain whale watching policies can have on these animals to see whether or not there are better policies that we can measure with scientific data on their health or their behavior uh, to be able to see what is the best way for us to act to balance this really cool industry with a really cool opportunity for us to connect with the natural world with allowing these animals to live their lives and in a healthy way. Cool. Um, I would like to follow up on that with a related uh, question myself, because you mentioned um, you, you, you know, during your presentation, you talked a little bit about captive uh, whales like at SeaWorld and, and places like that. And, it, and has, it has become very controversial at times. There was that um, that documentary called Blackfish uh, a couple of years ago and, and stuff like that. Can you. Can you explore a little bit the trade-offs between the benefits of keeping um, captive cetaceans in, in zoos and parks like that because of the way in which they can hopefully 
connect people to them that that can't go to uh, you know on a whale watching tour or whatever and the sort of the benefits to conservation of connecting people to to those animals versus the detriments of, of doing that yeah, yeah. It's, it's a question that has definitely been on people's minds for a long time and it's there, it's a hard balance to try and pick out what is the the correct end of the spectrum to fall on here because I think as I referenced in the presentation, it's these animals move thousands and thousands of miles throughout their life and it's hard to replicate in a healthy enough manner for these animals a habitat where they could suitably live for a long time. And I know a lot of these documentaries speak to that and there's a lot of conservation nonprofits and protest groups that speak to that especially because these animals do in terms of their their cognitive abilities, their brain size and things like that, they, they experience stress and fatigue and things like that in a way that's eerily similar to humans. And I think there's been a lot of research into how these types of captive situations impact and shorten their lives. Um, and these documentaries have also spoken to the danger directly to the human trainers that work with them. Um, Cause it is, it is tough to have to balance that. Um, and I think that dolphins are kind of the exemplary thing for that as well as orcas. Uh, they've been used for a very long time. They've been used in swim with dolphin encounters and sea world uh, orchestrations. And I, I think personally, it really boils down to the the situation that the animals are in. Um, oftentimes, when you think of zoos or in aquariums, these are animals that were injured that are being rehabilitated, um, and they might not be able to be released. And in that case, there's there's situations where you're allowed to capitalize on that in an environmental education manner for people who aren't going to get that education in a really positive way. Uh, but there has been a lot of success for the re-release of animals like orcas and dolphins that have been in captivity. Uh, you think of the, I'm forgetting his name, but the whale they used for free willy. Um, he was released into Iceland after living as a captive orca for a very long time. And he continued to live out the rest of his life. Um, it's just it's just a complicated balance because there's a lot of instances on either end of the spectrum where it's it's tough to balance the quality of life for those animals, but also in certain circumstances they do get injured and you can use that opportunity to to teach and grow. Um, I don't know if we'll ever come to a consensus on it, but it seems like more countries are beginning to move closer and closer to, to ending captivity. Um, and even for instances where certain militaries have used them before because of their cognitive abilities. So that's another more obscure part of captivity that is actually a thing as well. Mm -hmm. As luck would have it, we met Free Will, the, the whale that was used uh, in Free Willy when we were in Oregon one time. Uh, Kathy will remember that. And and we asked the the people that were conducting the little, the little tour of it. This was, I don't know, a year or two before he was... Um, released i and i can't remember her his name either now but um what was it kathy do you remember the the name yeah, yeah keiko yeah, yeah. and keiko. and uh and, they, tv and he had a television set and the guy i remember the guy telling us um that he yeah. enjoyed westerns in particular but and he was quite old mm -hmm. when he was released in iceland but he he died about a year Right. After the after they kept him in a large exclosure, but then I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, that he got an infection. Yep. And they, they tried away. to do well by preparing him for the release and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's a really interesting um, and not just a conservation yeah. question, but a but a sort of a human ethics. Um, you know, because we do, uh, mm -hmm. I think, all recognize the differences between highly intelligent animals and our use of them and our, and our treatment of them. Um, and, and so it, it, with, with whales and dolphins, you know, the, the most intelligent uh, mammals other than ourselves, we think about that a little bit differently than, than other people do. Um, I, I wanted to ask this question too, that comes from Kylie Galloway. Were you impressed or horrified with the whaling industry of the 19th century? That's another one of those things that brings up both the scientific aspects of conservation as well as the the, the sort of ethical uh, issues and 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 the fact that that nowadays more of us are 
are farther separated from the direct use of the natural world in our economy, um, we think about things very differently than people who lived closer to nature maybe just a couple hundred years ago. Right. I, I mean, I would say you think about just the, the graphic that I use, putting that tiny little wooden boat next to an animal that's four times the size of it. And I mean, it's, it's objectively fascinating and, and interesting that they were able to subdue these animals that weighed just tons and tons and they were just some some people in little wooden boats with spears and harpoons um, and their ingenuity and in basically making factories on their boats and finding all these uses um, you know with technology that's something we've never had to deal with something as simple as that but finding out all the different uses for the oils and boiling it down um, and and this is stuff that's still used today in a lot of indigenous communities but I think in that way, it's fascinating to find out the ways that they were able to find all these uses. Um, but then you get to the sheer numbers and the, the unsustainable way that they did it eventually is that as a biologist, uh, thinking about how, how fisheries work and how they've failed in the past is where they don't take into account how a whole population works or what size of the animal they're taking, whether they're taking all the adults or they're taking too many youth and things like that. And yeah, they really just decimated so many populations. And it's not just the 19th century. You think about things like the blue whales in Antarctica as technology progressed. I mean, I want to say there was 200 to 300,000 blue whales in Antarctica, and then they fished them down to around 1,000. Um, so there, there's still very real effects from whaling starting that far back. And in that way, it's, it's horrifying for someone who cares about those animals, but also for someone who understands the ecosystem services they provide to all the animals around them and us as well. Um, so it, on the scale that things were going on, you can understand how it was very much so a utility thing. And obviously there was a lot more constraints to the biological knowledge they had about how to do these things well. Um, but we look at it now and a lot of those populations are still recovering, have never recovered or are, are just getting back to more common levels across the globe in things like blue whales and humpback whales. Yeah, I, I, I would point out, too, that um, I, I always remember when, when anybody mentions blue whales, I remember back to being an undergraduate myself. And and I think my first upper level ecology course while I was an undergraduate, that would have been about 1975 or 1976 or so. And one of the things that we studied in there was the, the population dynamics of blue whales. And, and we fully expected at that time that they were on the brink of extinction and that within a few decades, there probably wouldn't be any blue whales left. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time on the ocean off Southern California where I was growing up and I've, I've still to this day never seen a blue whale, but people see them commonly off Southern California now. Mm -hmm. um, those those <clears throat> whaling protections as imperfect as they are really have made a difference for some species. And obviously things are not what they were before we started the industrial scale harvesting but but there is you know there is hope uh, I guess but well I, I think we're we're about an hour and a half in now and um, and and perhaps we should um, we should tie things up I, I, I would like for uh, to suggest that you um, may make some closing comments if you'd like to uh, Danny and then we'll turn it over to Tabitha yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for today. It was I'm I'm honored to be a part of another uh, event with Hope College. It's a great school. It taught me a lot of what I needed to get to here and be able to learn a lot about whales in the first place. Um, two of those people that are very responsible for that are Greg and Kathy. So thank you again for being here and for introducing me and fielding all these questions and. <laughs> Yeah. I, if you ever have any other questions about whales, I encourage you to seek them out because they play a lot of interesting roles in the world and check out some more cool books that Hope College tells you to read. Thanks, Danny. 
Wow, I just want to say those were such amazing questions. They were all super insightful. I wanted to say thank you for making them easy to understand for someone like myself who is not a biologist. Um, on behalf of our Lakeshore readers, I want to say thank you to Danny Kosiba for teaching us so much about whales. Another big thank you to da uh, Dr. Kathy Winnett-Murray and Dr. Greg Murray for introducing us to Danny and facilitating such a great Q&A. To our viewers, a big read thank you for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at more events this year. You can find more information on events as well as our program at bigreadlakeshore.com. Well, that's it for now. I hope you all have an amazing night. Thank you so much for coming.